So I've just recopied the DE and the initial conditions and let's go about finding the equation of motion. So first thing I would do is just take our DE and let's put it in the standard form where we have all of our terms over on the left side and then we've got zero on the right side. So normally we're used to seeing these DEs looking like y double prime plus 2y prime plus 4y, but in this problem x is playing the role of our dependent variable, so we're going to get used to seeing the x terms over on the left side here. Okay, so let's point out this is a constant coefficient DE, and so now to solve this we're going to think about setting up our auxiliary equation. Okay, normally we'd use the symbol m when working with the auxiliary equation, so we'd be tempted here to write m squared, but I'm reluctant to do that because we were talking about mass earlier in the problem. I don't want there to be any confusion here with mass. So usually what we do to get around this is just come up with a new variable like n or something like that to represent our auxiliary equation. So let's use n here. We'd have n squared plus 2n plus 4 equals 0. Okay, now we can solve this equation either by factoring or we could use the quadratic formula. In this case it's not going to factor very well, so let's use quadratic formula. n is going to be negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Um, and I hope there's no confusion here, but this is an entirely different b than we were talking about earlier in the problem. Okay, so just using the quadratic formula in the usual way, we would have n equals negative 2 plus or minus the square root of, well, b squared minus 4ac is going to give us negative 12, and that's all divided by 2. So let's simplify this root here. Let's think of that as root 4 times root 3 times root negative 1. And that way we can say n is equal to negative 2 plus or minus. If we simplify this expression here, we're going to have 2 root 3i. Remember, i is the symbol we're using for square root of negative 1. And that's all divided by 2. So we can divide both terms in the numerator by 2, and we get negative 1 plus or minus root 3i. Right, so we're in the situation of complex roots, and let's see if we can remember how to write down the general solution to the DE. So when working with complex roots, we use the symbols alpha and beta here to represent the two different coefficients. Alpha represented the real coefficient here, so the negative 1. Beta represented the coefficient of the i, so that would be root 3. Um, and there's no plus or minus, no i involved here, we're just picking out those coefficients. So normally we would write y equals e to the alpha x times c1 sine beta x plus c2 cos beta x but in this case, these aren't quite the right variables. Remember that in this problem, what we're doing is we're trying to describe displacement. We're trying to describe the position of our mass in terms of time. So x is playing the role of y, and t is playing the role that x would normally play. So we should really write x equals e to the alpha t, c1 sine beta t plus c2 cos beta t. So usually when I'm solving DEs, I really make a point of writing down, you know, what does the typical form of the solution look like, and then what are the variables that are appropriate for this particular problem. All right, so let's plug in here. Alpha is negative 1, so we get e to the negative t times c1 sine of root 3t plus c2 cos of root 3t. And I'm going to put a box around that. 
So that is our general solution, but what we need to do to finish up is to use the two different initial conditions, and that will lead us to finding values for C1 and C2. So first, let's use the fact that x is equal to 0.2 when t is equal to 0. So let's sub that in and see what we get. On the left side, we'd have 0.2. Oh, I should point out we're subbing into this equation that we got down here. So on the left side, we've got 0.2. On the right side, as we sub in t equals 0, the exponential is becoming 1. So we don't even necessarily need to write that down. We don't even necessarily need these brackets. Um, and then subbing in t equals 0, let's remember sine of 0 is 0. So we're getting c1 times 0 plus c2 times cos of 0 is 1. Okay, so really what's happening here is we've got 0.2 equal to c2. We've just found the value of c2. So let's take this information, let's plug it in here, and we'll update our function. So now we can say x is equal to e to the negative t times c1 sine root 3t plus 0.2 cos root 3t. Put a box around that because that's our most recently updated version of our function now. And next what we want to do here is use the fact that x prime of 0 is 0 and in order to do that we're going to need to get an equation for x prime. So let's think about applying the product rule here. We've got the exponential times the stuff in the brackets. So applying the product rule we'd have e to the negative t times root 3 c1 cos root 3t minus 0.2 times root 3 sine root 3 t. Okay, so that's just the first half of the product rule. I'm going to put plus here, make sure we remember the second part. Um, so in taking our derivatives here, we're applying the chain rule. That's why we're seeing these root 3s coming out in front. Derivative of sine is cos. Derivative of cos is negative sine. Okay, so that's the first part of the product rule. Now we need to go plus the derivative of the first factor, so negative e to the negative t times the second factor. So we'll just recopy the stuff in the brackets here. Great, so here's our equation for x prime. Let's plug in our initial condition, which is x prime is 0 when time equals 0. So plugging in here, we'd have 0 equals, the exponential is going to become 1, inside the first set of brackets, cos of 0 is 1, so we'd have root 3 c1 plus 0, because sine of 0 is 0, and then moving on to the second term here, we'd have plus negative 1, times, inside the last set of brackets here, sine of 0 is 0, and cos of 0 is 1. Okay, so if we simplify this equation, it looks like this. 0 is equal to root 3 c1 minus 0.2. So in other words, 0.2 is equal to root 3 c1, or 0.2 over root 3 is equal to c1. Okay, so in terms of writing c1, you could say it's 0.2 over root 3, or if you want to rationalize this, you could say 0.2 root 3 over 3, either way. So I think I'll go with the rationalized version, and let's take this and we'll plug it into our most recent version of x, which was this one here. So here we have our final answer. This is our 
equation of motion, it describes the displacement of the mass in meters at any point in time where time is measured in seconds. So last thing I want to do is just a quick visualization of the motion of our mass. So let's try to think physically and then mathematically. So remember that our mass started below equilibrium position. It was 20 centimeters below equilibrium position. So let's say here's our mass initially, um, and we just released it. So the mass is going to travel upwards through equilibrium position. It's going to travel a bit less far above equilibrium position, then it's going to stop, start traveling downwards. It's going to travel again less far, and so it's going to keep going up and down, up and down, but every time it comes up and down, it's traveling less and less far from equilibrium position. So I'm just, I'm drawing this staggered a little bit so that we can visualize the motion, but of course the mass would be traveling straight up and down. Okay, as time goes to infinity, the mass is going to come to rest at the equilibrium position. So that's physically what's happening with our mass. Okay, now let's see if we can see that action um, inside our equation here. So we've got two aspects here. We've got the exponential and we've got the trig functions here. So this exponential, it's got a negative exponent, meaning this number is getting closer and closer to zero as time goes to infinity. This is the part that is um, in the motion of the mass. This is the part that's saying, well, the mass is going to travel less and less far above or below equilibrium position as time goes on. Um, and then the sine and the cosine terms here, this is what's contributing to that up and down motion. So hopefully we understand the physics of what's going on in this system, um, and hopefully we can also make the connection between the mathematical equation that we've got and that physical motion. I hope you found the video series to be helpful. Thanks for watching.